So, Abhijit, today we are starting with log normal distribution. Okay. Mm -hmm. What idea you have about log normal distribution? Any general idea? It is used to compare a lot of data together. It's used to compare? Yes, uh, if the data points are very high or very low, you can use log. Oh, data to very visual. high or very low in the sense like you mean to say uh, on either sides or like only just one side? It helps visualize the data better is what I mean. No, 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 that's not right version. See, it's very simply understood thing. Log normal distribution starts from zero. It cannot be negative. First, I'll just explain the concept. This is a, so before going into log normal distribution, you really know what is normal distribution, correct? This is a normal distribution. It's a bell shaped curve. But if I start, so this has a mean. If I take standard normal distribution zero and standard deviation of one, two, okay? So that is what is the like general thing about normal distribution. So see, whatever you are studying, uh, like in this chapter or coming chapters of hypothesis testing or any topic, you would be given any other kind of distribution, but that has to come to normal distribution. The theme or the agenda would be that. Okay. Now the point is this particular log normal distribution starts from zero and it goes in this way. So now this is perfectly, you can understand it's skewed. Am I right? Yes. It's skewed, of course. It cannot take negative values. Imagine you were in your engineering days and uh, uh, like uh, you used to get your CGPA, correct? Do you think anyone has got negative CGPA at any point of time? Yeah. There's no scope or chance of negative CGPA. It starts from zero. Either one or two marks they will get, correct? Or if, if they get zero even, it starts from zero. There was no negative uh, marks anyone got, correct? Do you, did, is there any negative marks concept available? Never. We have not. We have not seen that. So if I take this, I I just make a uh, like axis here. I, in x axis I put the CGPA data, and y axis I put number of students. What? Of students. So here I am putting the CGPA scores in x axis, and in y axis I am putting number of students. And if I make a graph of log normal distribution, it will be like this. And very simply understood, uh, if number of students, if I take like uh, like uh, some 10, 20 in range of, or I take individual students, you know, this area would be the area where you'll be seeing maximum students falling. Okay. Let's say this is the maximum level of students. Let's say 10. So 10 students are those people who will be getting some CGPA of around let's say 7.5 to 8. Okay, in my example, and there are very less number of students who would be falling in this category. This category would be what? Naturally, this category would be 9.5, 9.7 CGPA, correct? Hello? Oh, yes, sir. So very less number of students would be in this particular area, this area. So uh, like, when we see this particular uh, like uh, distribution, it's a log normal distribution whereby very like very few people will be in this area and maximum people will be in this area. OK, and it cannot have any value less than zero. That's the reason why it cannot have it cannot form a symmetry. It will always be a skewed uh, distribution or a skewed curve. OK. So like if I say people buying cars, so uh, people buying cars of range 10 lakhs to 20 lakhs would fall in this data and people buying Bentley or Rolls Royce would be falling in this area. Or if I say in uh, like number of people you can put here, car values you can put here. Or if I take United States of America and if I take the incomes of people, I put some count here in millions, okay? 1 million, 2 million, 10 million, so 15 million people. If I consider the data of entire United States. If I have to put some people here, I can put Elon Musk. Correct. I can put Jeff Bezos. 
fine. In fact, like I can put likes of some Google's like uh, founder and all Larry Page or what what I, I just don't remember their name. So these people fall in this category, but maximum maximum people fall in this category, correct? So this is a log normal distribution. This is the general idea. OK, now I'll take a sub. Uh, I'll take I'll just make things neat and give you some notes. More than that, you don't require any other explanation for this. Not required and not tested by the CFA level one people. It's an engineering concept. So like in engineering or mathematics like BSc statistics or MSc statistics there, they just go for all this. And in today's world, we use Python and other uh, programming languages we have so we can easily use them and uh, find out our, our require, required uh, values, correct? So if this is your data, why are you so silent, Abhijit? You're following? This is your data and uh, this data. What do you see? What kind of data this is? What kind of distribution you're seeing here? Log normal distribution, correct? So if I put all the values here. And if I say this data is X. OK. This is Y. Y axis. This is axis actually. OK, count. This is X axis. Don't confuse with this. This is data. If I if I put a log to this data with base E, I get some data Y and that will take normal distribution. What will be that? So the log of lo the, the log normal distribution values what you are seeing here. If you apply natural log to that, you will get some values and that values will follow normal distribution. Understood? Very simply understood log of log normal distribution will give you normal distribution. And if you have normal distribution data. Like. Uh, if you put exponential to them e power x to them, what will you get? Log normal distribution, correct? Yes. Hello. Okay, Hello. Hello. Are you following Abhijit? I'm not able to hear your voice Abhijit a little bit even. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening. Am I audible? No, now I'm able to hear. Did you follow this? Oh, yes. If you take them and you do a exponential, you get log normal distribution and log normal distribution when you take. OK, that means log X base is Y E power Y is X. OK, this is logarithmic form. Exponential form will be E power Y is equal to X, correct? So E power Y is equal to X is what? Log normal distribution and log X base C is equal to Y is normal distribution. That means when you put log to log normal distribution values, you'll get normal distribution, correct? So let's take a. So this is what you understood. So I'll put some notes here. You you just make a note of that, and then we'll go for a small example and close this concept. More that's more than enough for you to understand. So if I have to put some important points or notes here, I'll put it in this way. OK, some important discussion I'm doing with you. So I'll just uh, write it here. A random variable. Is set. To have. A log. Normal distribution. If it's. Natural logarithm has a normal distribution. Which I explained you right now. OK. In other words. The exponential. Of a normal distribution. Of a normal random variable. 
has a log normal distribution and if this you will be seeing in case of incomes log normal distribution when you see the incomes of people when you see the grades of students when you give credit ratings to the customers okay in all those cases log normal distribution comes into picture i'll make a chart x y let's say x is log normal okay implies y is equal to log x that is normal that means if x is log normal log of that is normal correct just a second what did i say if x is log normal log of this x which will give me y and that will follow normal distribution and if y is normal x would be exponential of y that will be log normal just make a note of this we'll move forward Yeah, you can move. OK, I'm moving forward, fine. So there's a task. All data we will take and we'll try to make a log normal distribution for your convenience. We'll try to find things. You will only like uh, support assist me in that. So we take the person's name. Rob. Let's say Tom mm, Z. And uh, Alex, uh, let's say Tony, and uh, randomly we'll take Sophia. So credit score uh, of 750 this guy has. So in banks they can uh, take this, okay, to to do their to find out their normal distribution. 820 and credit scores are here for negative credit scores they won't give any loans you already know that incomes of the people let's say this is 80,000 rob and here see you always know incomes won't follow incomes will never never be negative correct no one in the world would, would work for negative incomes that's a highly impossible thing to even think of so you see Tony is having the extreme income. He 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 lies in the extreme, correct? 75,000 and then loan approve. Then we say age. Let's say 32, 45, 33, 51, 35, the youngest one and the 31. OK, and then uh, loan approval status. So yes to Rob and because the credit scores are good. Serious no for Tom. Yes, no. Yes, of course, yes and yes. OK, status and then logarithm. You see, this is following what log normal distribution. Correct, Abhijit? Yes. Hello. Oh, yes. It's following. And if I want to convert this into normal distribution, what I'll do and I'll, I'll show you also. What is the importance of convert? Why now you'll be asking a question when I'm having log normal distribution, why I should go for conversion and what is the need for that? That's a question a student would have. So the question's answer would be with this data you'll see log of this income. Can you find the log values for all this, please? And tell me. 80,000, all this. Uh, 
फोर पॉइंट नो नो सेवेंटी सेवन थाउजेंड कैन यू वंस अगेन ओके so when you see this data what are you seeing this data is very closely uh, like uh, very closely uh, followed by the values correct so yeah. you see this extreme value and then you see the minimum value so i can just try to keep something as my average like 4.81 and see above and below that correct so you see the incomes were like 5 lakh 50000 is something very extreme one but when i see this data i can put that data in a normal distribution correct yes that's what it is fine let's move forward see now i don't think i need to explain all this it's very simple uh, i have i've already explained you now see calculate and interpret a continuously compounded rate of return given a specific holding period return so you know like we already have good idea about discretely compounded like when you, when there's a semi annual compounding or there's a monthly compounding correct you can count the compounding on fingers so if it's like uh, semi annual compounding you you divide the rate okay and then you get the returns here you divide by months and you get the returns correct see values are very near they are very near values we near by values correct so since the compounding is more here you'll get a get a slightly higher value correct abhijit we have already done the time value of money fine so what is the effective annual rate formula in terms of continuously compounded rate so effective annual rate is the uh, like uh, exponential of Uh, like returns which are continuously compounded minus one. Okay, Abhijit, are you following? Hello. Yeah. Now, based on a stated rate of ten percent, if I consider this ten percent as uh, a rate with continuous compounding. i get the returns 10.5171 which is even higher than these two see they are very near to 10 but this is very higher because of continuously compounding fine so like if this is exponential i can also use natural log in this case since the natural log of e power x is x okay e power x is equal to uh, like you know a power x is equal to n so log n to the base a is equal to x okay okay so log of e power x is x okay now we can get continuously compounded rate from an effective annual rate by using the logarithm calculator fraction so in previous example log of this would give you 10% that means if you took the exponential you got the returns log of this returns will give you the rate that's it effective rate okay exponential has given you 10.5171 log of 10.5171 will give you 10% effective rate finished so now here we get a formula log natural logarithm if logarithm of logarithm of price relative see this is the current year stock value let's say this is the previous year stock value so we are re, we are comparing them so that should always be equal to logarithm of 1 plus holding period return and that is always equal to
continuously compounded rate. Okay. Can you do this question, Abhijit? Hello. Abhijit, can you solve this question? Please hold Okay, do this. Finish. Shall we go forward? So you see the log of this, you got this. Okay. And this is also equal to one plus holding period return. You get this only. Correct. See, when you when you had the stock with you, you held it, and the return what you got is 20%. So if I take log of that, I get the I get what? I get returns, correct? Continuously compounded returns. Fine. That means annual rate of return. That's what. So again, there's a formula you can put E power RCC minus uh, into T time period. It depends upon like uh, like let's say if it is like for one year, you won't put anything into one. But if it's for two years or five years, you have to put that in place of T to get holding period returns. OK, when the returns are continuously compounded. Now we come into the next distribution called students T distribution. See, student's T distribution is some, not something very different from normal distribution. It is very much similar in shape. It's a bell-shaped probability distribution, and uh, it is symmetrical about its mean. It for it's like you know, it's like very similar to normal distribution. But there are some uh, like characteristics what it has. It is appropriate distribution to use when constructing confidence intervals based on small samples. That means. The sample size should not be more than 30. If the sample is less than 30, then you can use this student state distribution. OK, OK. And one more point is so sample should be less than 30 and population with unknown variance. That means you should not know the variance of the population. OK, OK. And the and the distribution should be normal or approximately normal distribution, because if you take very large data, then ultimately normal distribution you will see. Correct, but with small data, it, it will not be perfectly normally distributed. That's what we see. So it may also be appropriate to use distribution when the population variance is unknown and the sample size is large enough that the C. Now this is a very important point. Now you'll be like there will be a confusion. See, I already declared your data, your sample should be less than 30, but at times it may also be appropriate to use this T distribution. See why I'm putting so much focus and stress on all these distributions is next chapter is going to be a hypothesis testing the coming chapter and there all these distributions are going to use. So you should have good amount of knowledge and uh, idea about this. Okay. It may also be appropriate to use T distribution when population variance is unknown and sample size is large enough. That sample size, the central limit theorem will assure that the sampling distribution is approximately normal. That means this theorem should say that the no sampling distribution is approximately normal. OK, which theorem okay. central limit theorem. So do you have any idea about central limit theorem, Abhijit? Uh, it's regarding the bell distribution. No? Sorry? About the bell distribution, the central limit theorem. No, 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 uh, no. Shall I explain you what that central central theorem is with some good intuitive example? Hello. No, yes, please. Okay. See, what happens is if the data becomes large, large, and large, the curve will become normal dis normal distribution curve. How? We'll see a very good example of which you'll never forget in your life this one. Yes. 
Any free space for this two minutes? Okay, so we'll just put it here. See, imagine uh, rolling a die. Okay, I'm just putting one die. Okay, Bijit. And you uh, like uh, roll it lot of times, lot of times. And I'm asking you, what is the probability of getting one, two, three, four, five, six? It is always uh, like following a uniform distribution, correct? Yes. See, I have many good examples to prove you. Just a second, Abhijit. Yeah, busy. Okay. Uh, so, see, I have very good examples for center limit theorem. I can take some good examples, but I find this one the best one. So, if I roll this die, I have to get one, two, three, four, five, six. Correct. Yes. So, what happens is, uh, but at the end, I'll put the conclusion for you. So, it's like I see the probability is zero, zero point zero five. And slightly you know 0 0.16. Let's keep let's keep it. You know, 1 by 6 is I think 0 0.16, and your entire data would lie in this. Correct? This is a normal uniform distribution normal distribution? Uniform distribution. Hello. Yes. I shall give you five minutes. Right. The data should be discrete, right? Yeah, this is see. This is I'm just putting this zone, this area, Vijay. Oh, okay, okay. Normal distribution. This is uniform normal distribution. Now, now point number two is, if you see, I take two dice. Uh, I'll just put it here. Yeah, if I take two dice, okay, and you know, like for two dice. Uh, like uh, I'll just put it, put the distribution here. So two, three, four, five. See, for two dice, you will not have one single number. Okay, that means when you throw the die, you will be having one one on both the dice. There is no zero, so that one one would sum and become two. Correct. So I started from two. Understood, Abhijit? Hello. Yes. Yes. So that one one would sum and become two. OK, so these are the so the uh, two dice. When we see two faces as six and six, it can take maximum number of 12. And when we see one and one, it can take maximum number of two. And the probability is here. 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2. OK. Now you have two die Abhijit, two dice, and you have a one in 36 chance of a two. That means if two dice fall and you see one one here, so you sum and you may you it becomes two, correct? This will happen how many times, Abhijit? One and one possibility can only happen. It is possible one out of the 36 times, correct? Because when I take two dice, the total uh, outcomes would be 36. Fine. So one out of 36 only can be a case whereby I'll be seeing two, a sum of two, correct? So that one by 36 becomes what? 0 0.03. Huh. So my data will start from here. And also you will see 12. See, you throw two dice and you see one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six. This also would be one out of 36 times, correct? So I start, I can put that here. 
Yes. Yes. Now, if I ask you one more question, but like you see seven, if I ask you a question seven, so how many times you see seven? How many times I see seven? One and six. See seven, three comma four, four comma three, two comma five, five comma two. Any more times? One, one comma six. six. 6 comma 1. So this is happening 7, uh, 6 out of 36 times, correct Abhijit? So 1 by 6 can I put? Hello? Oh, yes. So that is happening the maximum times. So my uh, probability would be here 0 0.16. So if I want to make a normal, I want to make a curve, it becomes in this way, correct? The data has come in this way, correct or wrong? Yes. Now I'll consider 3 dice Abhijit. So with one dice, you understood what was the case. With two dice, you clearly understood what's the case in the shape. With three dice, you will again understand the final case and you will be able to differentiate and decide whether it's following normal distribution or not. So I take three dice. Okay. And uh, I'll just put the data here. So zero and here also I put the probabilities. 3 and uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, because I have small space here, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay. Now, if I take three dice and uh, chance of getting three is what? Uh, one, one, one. So, one see, one time it will be only just one by two sixteen, correct? Yes. So one by two sixteen is what Abhijit? Can you tell me? Zero point double zero four six. So I can start from here, na? Very near to zero, and also getting a eighteen. That means three six is also the same. One out of two sixteen. Correct. And if I want to get 11, how many times I can get 11 out of the three dice if I throw? Mm -hmm. That would be the highest chance. Okay. Yeah. 10 or 11 would be the highest. Correct or wrong? That is coming in the middle. Na? So my curve will, my data will become a normally distributed data. Abhijit. Clearly, very clearly it will take this graph. Okay. So what do you understand from this? If you take more and more data, this will become normally distributed. That is what the central limit theorem says. There will be a mean, there will be a variance and with more and more data, if you take, I took one dice, you see I did not get normal distribution. I took two dice, in every case there is a mean and there are a lot of, uh, like lots, lot of data right and left of the mean and there is a distribution, uh, there is a deviation from the mean and what I see is like, uh, mean uh, when I have a mean variance, these all are some things, something which I I take into consideration when I see a normal distribution. And but what to my what notice what I have noticed here is when I'm in when I'm just uh, like uh, increasing the size of the data. Okay, when I took one dice, I did not get normal distribution. Two dice, and I did not get perfect normal distribution. But when I took three dice. I'm getting a perfect normal distribution. If I take four, five, six, seven, one, I'll be getting very perfectly the normal distribution, correct? Yes, so that yes, is yes. what the central theorem says. The data, if you take very big data set, that will be mean reverting. What will that be? Reversion. Mean reversion concept, okay? That's what is central limit theorem. Now, next one. Where is that? What is uh, this uh, degree of freedom, Abhijit? Uh, I mean, uh, I do not know. So I mean, I Can you question. not ask questions, you mean to say? <laughs> no, you see, I have something in mind, but I'm not able Yeah, to yeah, that's it. what I wanted. What that something you have. That is what I wanted, Abhijit. Just to know, that's it. I have curiosity, na?
you will be coming across this concept of degrees of freedom abhijit so let me make you clear in that also with a intuitive example okay see if i tell you degrees of freedom you take n minus 1 doesn't it doesn't uh, like uh, be going well so what is degree of freedom abhijit please understand this concept okay so this is you let me take you as an example and uh, you have seven hats with you okay how many hats seven hats so first day of the week monday how many hats you can wear abhijit one hat hmm? one hat you will wear one hat only but no, no. you have choice of how many hats to wear seven any any you can wear any of the seven hats am i right yes there is no restriction na because you have you can wear any of the seven hats day 2 what will happen i mean if you are not see, repeating the hat you can wear six hats yeah so you can wear because see you have constraints here let me be very clear you have only seven hats and uh, you want to wear a different hat every week my question is that seven hats and you have to wear different hats every day of week that is the precondition okay so day 2 you can wear own, uh, how many hats maybe 7 minus 1 6 you can choose from the six you can choose from the six remaining hats okay so six hats six from six hats you can choose any of the hat okay so any or any one from six hats can i say yes. third day any one from five hats fourth day any one from four hats okay third day any one from three hats am i right yes second day any one from two hats last day what do you can do you only have one choice so you can only take one hat that finally that one hat is the only one which is available for you correct yes so when i come to the uh, like day 7 1 2 3 4 5 sorry 5 putting this to here so these are the seven days and the seventh day you have no other choice abhijit okay after you choose your hat for day 6 you have no choice for the hat that you can wear on day 7 you had choices only till here so with with this what we can conclude so you must wear one remaining hat so you had how much freedom 7 minus 1 6 days of hat freedom correct last yes. day you cannot freely wear any of the hats whatever you want am i right yes. this is the idea behind the degrees of freedom that means last day your data is restrict that you have the you have no option you are left over with options only in the 6 days that's the reason why we deduct one and we consider n minus 1 degrees of freedom is this right shall we move forward Do you understood hello yeah understood any like questions you want to make mm, you see if somebody were to ask me what is degrees of freedom i can if i cannot give a this big of an explanation see, you don't it? you need not say to them na you it is only about understanding ha ha so i agree that's what it is it's all about understanding see uh, if you if you can uh, if you if you cannot tell what you really no about degrees of freedom then on what basis you will be saying them i can give you another example also for this if you want so suppose your sample size is 5 okay 1 3 5 7 9 so if you want to make uh, find out the mean of this find out the mean of this so i when i add 25 i get 25 by 5 is equal to 5 correct hello oh yes 
Now, if I take 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7, put it divided by 5 and keep it 5 here, what would be this question mark be? What can it take? I mean, there's only one. It unit. has to take nine only. Am I right? Yeah, there's no other possibility. So any other possibility is there? No. That means last one, there is no choice. So the degrees of freedom is what here? Out of this five, four. Am I right? You can vary this four uh, numbers anytime, but the last one should be fixed. That is right or wrong? Yes. That's what. That is the concept. That's it. Now you can better explain. Now. So student state distribution has following properties. It is symmetrical. It is defined by defined by a single parameter. Degrees of freedom where degrees of freedom are equal to number of sample observations minus one. Why I have already explained you. Uh, it has more probability in the tails. That's made that means fatter tails than normal distribution. Uh, as the sample size goes higher, it follows closely approaches normal distribution. When compared to normal distribution, T distribution is flatter with more area under the tails. That is, it has fatter tails. As degrees of freedom for T distribution increase, this this uh, approaches the normal distribution. Correct? Because the sample size is increasing. Since sample size is increasing, degrees of freedom will also increase. That will make the distribution to approach normal distribution. Fine. I think you have understood the concept very clearly now. So degrees of freedom for tests based on sample size are n minus one because given the mean. Only n minus observations can be unique. That means you have that n minus one only is the is the available like variability of the data can happen. That means the data can only have flexibility in that. Last one is always fixed. And okay. symmetrical t distribution is symmetrical distribution that is centered about zero. Uh, the because it follows normal distribution. Now if data size is big, the shape of t distribution is dependent on number of degrees of freedom. As I told you. The more the number of degrees of freedom, the more the chance of this T distribution following the normal distribution. OK. So T distribution is flatter and thicker it's tails attentive. than normal. Sorry. It's attentive. Yeah, actually two minutes. Huh? So actually some some particular app. This is coming as uh, some message tone. Very irritating. Just give me a second. Abhijit. Yeah. T distribution is flatter and has thicker tails than standard normal distribution. As the number of observations increases, it becomes more spiked. Tails become thinner. OK, first it will be thicker. Data size increases, becomes thinner and it absolutely approaches the normal distribution. Number of degrees. So all these things is the repetition. It's going on repeating now. Uh, we will see some points here. Abhijit. This is the uh, like there will be two things here. One tail test and you'll be doing a hypothesis testing. You'll be coming across one tail test and two tail tests. If you have a data whereby the test statistic is more than more than the like uh, you'll be finding out the uh, critical values. See uh, in the sense uh, yesterday we did now Z score and all we calculated correct. Hello. Oh yes. So see there are five steps you have to follow in the hypothesis testing while doing the chapter. We'll do that. If you see a greater than sign. Okay. Comes one tail test less than sign one tail test. If you see is equal to sign two tail test understood. Okay. Okay. So like that point of time what they are saying is. Uh, the table 4.8 contains. So we will see critical values here. One tail critical values for T distribution at 0 0.05. See if I speak about one tail 0 0.05, two tail, you will divide the 0 0.05 into two parts. That is 0 0.025. Correct. When you divide this two by two, you get two 
things now that is in two tail you will be having this side as well as this side 0.025 here 0.025 here correct in one tail test it will be just one side that is 0.05 understood abhijit hello oh yes and you see z tables we see the things back side of the table here t table you see here one tailed probabilities are given to you okay a uh, table of critical t values so when we will be finding out our test statistic we have to compare with the critical values more than or less than we have to compare with the critical values and we have to decide so that how to find out that we will see in the next uh, coming session when we will be doing hypothesis test these are the degrees of freedom these are the probabilities okay so when i speak about 0.05 one tail two tail these are the ones you are seeing so when the degrees of freedom are high more peaked the distribution is that means it is more uh, it is approaching normal distribution less peaked with less uh, what we say degrees of freedom because the sample size is uh, smaller the sample size is even more smaller so you see more flatter one okay let's come to the f distribution abhijit so like t distribution uh, like we are discussing about chi square and f distribution okay these are also uh, like uh, these are also in the family of distributions so like t distribution a chi square that is you like show that with this particular greek letter is a family of distributions each based on degrees of freedom okay there or here also they follow degrees of freedom the chi square distribution is a distribution of sum of squared values of n random variables here you can see sum of squared values of n random variables and k the degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1 so here degrees of freedom k will be equal to n minus 1 okay now because it is sum of squared values it will never be having it will never be having a negative value because you know negative also becomes positive when you square it so it's it it so chi square distribution is bounded from below by zero so it will start from zero only it is typically asymmetric but you know its symmetry increases when degrees of freedom increases that means the sample size increases it also will follow normal distribution as degrees of freedom get larger that is only because of the sample size increasing this chi square distribution also approaches normal distribution in shape chi square distribution is often used in test of so this is very important now where you will be using this you will be using this very often in tests of value of variance of normally distributed population that means variance is equal to some value variance is null hypothesis see there are two hypotheses correct hypothesis is nothing but belief so null will null hypothesis will be having some kind of belief that variance is equal to let's say 5 we have to prove that it is not equal to 5 let's say in such kind of cases you'll be using this chi square distribution okay because variance you'll be getting by squaring the values squaring the deviations correct or wrong abhijit yes are you following next point next coming to f distribution is the distribution of quotient of two appropriately scaled independent chi square variable so we have this by m this is a sum of squared values divided by number of values and sum of squared values again divided by number of values so average of squared values i can say okay so really literally i am speaking about variance as abhijit am i right i am speaking about variance very clearly so when you will be using this and all this also is the same thing when you will be having more data if the degrees of freedom high then definitely this will also follow normal distribution but when will be you when you will be using this a common use of f distribution is to determine the probability that two that the variances of two independent normal distributions are equal okay let's say the null hypothesis which i denote with h not h not is like variance of data 1 okay is not equal to variance of data 2 if if null hypothesis says what does the alternate hypothesis say that means the hypothesis what we will be doing 
we will be proving null wrong and will be showing that variance of the data one is equal to variance of data two. And in this cases, what distribution will be using Abhijit? Correct. Yes, please tell me. Abhijit, I'm asking a question. Can you answer? Yes. That's what finished. So Abhijit, only one last topic is there that is Monte Carlo simulation. See, I will tell you what this exactly is. OK. See, what is simulation Abhijit, first of all? Simulation is already a basic word. Uh, for a given set of input, what might be the output? No, no, no. Abhijit, can we do one small thing? Can we take up this topic tomorrow? Actually, I'm having some stomach upset today. I'm not well. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry for this. Uh, if you want, still in. Hello. Sorry. I'm not even to play you. I'm just calling you two minutes. 